right, God bless you guys. And man, what a powerful name it is. I mean, demons tremble at his name. And we accept Christ. We have a relationship with Christ. I mean, greater is he than he that is in the world. I mean, we just have so much to be grateful for. And we take these things for granted. Please take your seats. And it's just so awesome to come here and actually worship. I mean, we have the authority. We have that great privilege of being able to call on the Lord anytime. Not only is he with us, we get to call on him. We talk about having a big brother that's going to come up and stand up for your battles. Hey, you have God on your side. That's really awesome. Well, open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We're going to continue our series that we've titled From Throne to Trough. And what Christmas is really about is that a loving God that created all of us, created everything, left his throne in heaven to come and be born in a trough. And actually, that's probably as much as we ever gave him while he lived here because his next big prize that we gave him for everything he did for us was to hang him on a cross and crucify him. And then God the Father placed all the sins of the world upon him. So that's what r Christmas is really about. There's, there's a saying that says, uh, most people don't really want the truth. They just want constant reassurance of what they think to be truth. In other words, we don't really want to hear the truth a lot of times. We just want other people to go ahead and reassure us that whatever we believe is true. We're going to speak a little bit about truth. Because right now we, we're, we're talking about Christmas. But the Christmas that the world pitches to us is an absolute lie, beginning from the beginning all the way through the end. It's an absolute lie. So they want us to believe in something that doesn't exist. They want us to believe that if we go over there and we spend everything that we have and not have, that we're going to be filled with joy, happiness, and all the problems of the world are just going to go away. I guarantee you, from the very beginning through the entire season of Christmas, everything that the world wants us to believe is an absolute lie. So we want to look at the truth. The, the truth. The title of this message is The Truth in Christmas. The Truth in Christmas. And refer to the truth. We're going to look at somebody that is iconic in a Christmas story, and it has to do with the Virgin Mary. We're going to speak a little bit about Mary. We're going to learn a lot about her. So we're going to see why is it important for us to actually learn from Mary because we always speak about her faith. But sometimes we overlook a few things. But it's not only her faith. It's what caused her faith to grow in a way where she was willing to accept and pay a price that she had to pay for the rest of her life for actually being used by God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in your name, Jesus, we come before you at this time. Pray that you use me to bring your word. I pray that you touch every heart, that we understand that what the world wants us to believe is Christmas has nothing to do with what Christmas is really about. Christmas is about what you gave to us that we should have already received. And if there's someone here that hasn't received that gift of salvation, or perhaps uh, has compromised their walk with you, that you just touch your hearts and, and they don't leave here without actually having a wholehearted commitment to serving you. I pray that you just meet us right where we're at. And that when we leave here today, we realize that we have so much to be grateful because everything that we need, you've already given, and that is salvation. Anything less than that is unnecessary for us to actually be the person that you created us to be. So, Lord, thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for all your blessings. And we just place this teaching in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, we're going to start this off because six months before... Mary is visited by the angel Gabriel, okay? There's another person that was visited, and this is Zechariah. Zechariah, let's read what happens. We know that once a year, the high priest would have to go into the holies of holies, and there was a ritual that he had to perform, and what they would do is they would actually cast lots at this time in history, at the time of, of this writing, and they would cast lots, and whoever got the lot, they said, okay, that's Whoever won, you're the chosen one to go in there. So he'd have to prepare himself with a set of rituals and so forth. And he'd have to go, he'd have to go and, and perform certain rituals. So right before when he's done with everything, um, he'd walk into the holies of holies. So he's about to walk into the holies of holies. And if he didn't prepare himself spiritually and follow the rituals as God demanded, everything they had to do, the Spirit of God would kill him on the spot. The minute he walked in through the holies of holies, through that... Through those curtains, boom, the Spirit of God would kill him. So it's something that uh, 
everybody's outside. A lot of times they'd tie up whoever's going in there with bells and, and ropes in case they didn't hear the bells uh, 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 chiming. They figured, uh-oh, <laughs> I guess he wasn't right. Let's drag him out because they couldn't go in to retrieve the body or they would be killed as well. So that's what's taken place. And uh, verse 11, Luke 1. This is six months before, and it's important that we see where we're at here. And it says, while Zechariah was in the sanctuary, he's not in the holies of holies yet. It says, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the incense altar. This is just right outside the holies of holies. It said, Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. It goes on and says, your wife, I know she's over the hill, and so are you. But guess what? It's going to happen, buddy. You've got a child coming. It says, your wife Elizabeth will give you a son, and you're going to name him John. This is going to be no other than John the Baptist. You're going to have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord, but he must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. It says, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord. Let's go to verse 18. Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man, and my wife is also along in years. And all of a sudden, I'll just summarize it for you. Angel says, okay, you don't want to believe me? I am Gabriel. I stand before the throne of God. So there's some very powerful angels. I mean, there's angels that God's created all over heaven, but standing before the throne of God, you're a mighty, powerful angel. He says, I'm going to shut your mouth, and until your child is born, you're not going to be able to say a word. So he walked out of there for the entire preg term of the pregnancy. He wasn't able to speak, and he'd have to write. And then finally, when the baby's born, and they're like, hey, what are we going to name him? And he goes up to write, and all of a sudden, boom, the baby's born. So he says, John, and he begins to speak. So we know this, but we're going to see that, hey, he questioned God, and he was chastised for that. Let's go ahead and fast forward six months later, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, it's a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. And Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. And I just want to take a pause here as always and I know that you all know that I, I uh, generally use the uh, New Living Translation here. So I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, the angel said, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found a favor with God. You're going to conceive and give birth to a son, and you're going to name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever, and his kingdom will never end. Again, We've got to understand that the Messiah had to come from Abraham. Later on, it was a promise made to David. Had to come from David. So from the lineage of David, both Joseph and Mary came from the lineage of David. Though we, had, we know Joseph had absolutely nothing to do with what's taking place here. Uh, verse 33, he will reign over Israel. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked, verse 34, how can this happen? I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son. And now in the sixth month, for the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And uh, we're going to stop there. For a second, it says the angel left her. Now, I want to speak a little bit about pluralism versus absolute. Pluralism versus absolute. Pluralism pretty much teaches us that there are no absolutes. Matter of fact, the only absolute is what they believe. You know, that's pretty much what humanists and atheists believe. You know, yeah, if it's what's right for you, it may be true for you, but it may not be true for me. In other words, you may like chocolate ice cream, and you say chocolate ice cream is the best. That is subjective, but you know what? I like vanilla, so it's not true for me. So you live however you choose to, except there's only one problem, is that if you live the way you choose to, and 
it's in disagreement with what they believe should be correct, then there's going to be a problem. So they even contradict the way they live. Now, they're speaking about, you know, absolute truth. Every time they say that there's no absolute truth, well, then I guess next time you see zero plus zero, um, you can go ahead and have it end up being whatever you want it to be. You know what? It equates to whatever I want it to be. After all, what's true for me may not be true for you. Imagine if we lived in a way where everybody lived as they saw it to be right. That's exactly what anarchy is all about. So then these terrorists that go over there and commit these heinous crimes on a mass scale, or even one person that gets killed, that's what they chose to do. How about the violation of people that, uh, women, or, or even men for that matter, and children, well, they chose to do that, so I, I guess if you're a victim, hey, too bad for you, next time you learn to run a little faster. It's your problem, not ours. So that's not a way to live, but that's pretty much what they argue. But I want to speak a little bit about absolute truth. Absolute truth. Because the first point I want to make, and that is the following. The word of God is absolute truth. The word of God is absolute truth. Absolute truth means it is absolutely true with no room for flexibility. Whenever we're sharing the word of God, we don't need to be apologetic for it. We shouldn't fear saying what it says. As a matter of fact, I can assure you that whenever you share the word of God, you're going to anger a lot of people because they don't believe there's absolute truth except what they want to believe in, of course. So when you come up and say, this is what the word says, and there is no room for flexibility, it's going to anger a lot of people. So absolute truth means there is no room for flexibility. The word of God is absolute truth. Because if we ever doubt any of it, then all of it, okay, leaves room for doubt. And if there's room for doubt, that means it's not absolute. That means I can believe whatever I want. I can choose, pick and choose what I believe is convenient for me. So it would not be the word of God because then there would be no God. Because whatever God says, we've got to do. So we got to look at this because you may find yourself in a situation where someone asks you, how do you know that that, that, that that is the word of God? After all, humans lie. How do you know that they didn't change it over time? Matter of fact, you tell me a story, I'm going to share it to somebody else. By the time we were three or four cycles into it, it's completely been turned around. Yes, that's true. But you know what? God is, a, is God. He is very powerful, and he knew about this in advance, so it's very important for him to have preserved his word. Today we are blessed. We're blessed because the word of God has been completed. During the Old Testament times, it had not been completed. They didn't have all the New Testament. They didn't have any of the, the, the Old Testament wasn't even completed. So things were going along. Now we have over, uh, basically, a 4,000 year period, and in between that time, God used certain people to actually bring his word about. So here we are, 2019, we have the word of God. It begins in Genesis, and it closes in Revelation. No more, no less, and there's nothing that was hidden from us. This is the word of God. So I'm just going to speak a little bit about it, because we need to understand first, we need to believe before we can actually believe. We're going to speak a little bit about faith. Why it's the word of God? Well, the best way to know if something is accurate or not is to actually examine, okay? Examine the evidence, okay? Examine the evidence. One of the things that we're gonna see is that Mary here in verse 29, she's confused and disturbed, and she tried to think. You know, let's put ourselves in, in Mary's shoes. Here's pretty much what's going on. She's over here minding her own business. Let's say you're over there and you're enjoying the 91 freeway. I know that's impossible, but for whatever reason, this is pretend land. You're on the 91 freeway and you're going west and you know you actually get to move 17 inches every hour and a half. But you know, I guess your latte is just great. You know, you got the peppermint and the mocha and you got great worship music. You're minding your own business and you know, you're, you know, you're, you're just having a great time. And all of a sudden, someone appears in your passenger seat and starts talking to you. Hey, how's it going? Wouldn't that scare the wits out of you? That's pretty much what's happened to Mary. That's where she's at. All of a sudden, boom, this person just appears and starts talking to her. I mean, I'm giving her a lot of credit. We see how Zechariah, and we're going to go ahead and compare 
shortly the difference is because one receives a curse, the other one receives a blessing in a way. What's the difference? We need to understand this for, for, our, for our own lives. So that's what actually happened to her. So she begins to think, you know, what this could mean. Obviously, uh, something just not right here. What is going on? Well, what she's actually doing is she's examining the evidence. I mean, this week I had jury duty, and I'm very grateful to God that I got called in on Friday. I mean, I think it's something that we should all be responsible about. I think the best way to get uh, what I'm going to say uh, I'll use the term fair, never perfect verdicts is for believers to be on the jury. But uh, I got called in on Friday, and you know, I was like looking at all these people that were getting called, and finally at 12 o'clock, they said the rest of us that hadn't been called, you can go home. I was thrilled about that, you know, but I was just like thinking, okay, if, if I'm called and I'm going to be on a trial, I'm going to make sure that you know, I stay awake and I pay a lot of attention, take good notes, because I want to go ahead and examine all the evidence. Granted, it's subjective on both sides. Prosecution is going to give you subjective evidence, and the defense is going to give you subjective evidence, but somewhere there's got to be some truth, and I've got to weigh it out. So I was like putting myself in the situation. Well, that's exactly what we're going to do with the Bible. You know, we've got to be objective about it. Okay, and we're going to see why the next point I'm going to make. So right now I just want to examine some of the evidence about it. First of all, God, okay, let's go to Romans 1 really quick. God knows what he's doing. And what it's all going to amount to is that the Bible, God's word, which is absolute truth, okay, says that no one has any excuse. That even if there were no word of God, even if you were out there living in the jungles and you were as illiterate as you can be, there's no excuse for not knowing God. Let's go to Romans 1. Let's look at verse 19 and 20. So here's the first thing we've got to look at. So even if there is no word of God, okay, Verse 19 says that everyone knows the truth about God because he made it obvious to them. It, goes, it says, ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. This is God. This is God's word. He says no one has any excuse. Sometimes, hey, what happened to those people? I don't know what happened to them. I'm just saying the word of God tells me, and I'm going to believe it, whether there's logic or not, that there's no excuse. Why is that? Well, it applies to us today, I think, a lot more profound than it ever did 2,000 years ago when that was written. Today, with all the science that we have, they get to go into every planet, different galaxies, and what I notice again, very basic stuff, he says there's no excuse. You know what? Every planet is a perfect sphere. And it has its own elements. It has its own atmosphere. Even the sun is round. Every time they discover a new planet, oh wow, it's round. Oh, it just happened. Do you see how they're trying to suppress the truth? How about science with our physiology? We got hormones, we got pheromones, we got cells. There's cells that we haven't even discovered yet. And look at the way they operate. So it basically says that we could not have came out of nothing. Going back to zero plus zero equals whatever you want it to be. That's wrong. And they will be the first to tell you that. So if there's nothing in space, how are you going to have all these perfect galaxies that are all perfectly formed together? So no one has any excuse. So there's no excuse. Here it is. And today in 2019, we have more information, though we don't know everything about our galaxy or our own bodies, we have so much information where we've got to conclude something put this together. If the earth would not tilt on its axis, we wouldn't be able to survive, we wouldn't have all these beautiful seasons, we wouldn't have all these winds, these crosswinds and, and winds that actually give us these temperatures and the air that we need, the oxygen that we need to exist. If it was a little too close to the sun, we would just burn up. If it was too far, we would just freeze up. Everything is perfect. Even where our oceans sit, everything just kind of balances itself out. Oh, it just happened. Okay. There's no excuse, guys. All right? There's no excuse. Word of God. In verse Psalm 19, it says that, hey, the heavens proclaim God's glory. Let's go ahead and jump over to uh, Hebrews 1 because I wanted to start off with the foundation that there is no excuse. If you say, well, I'm illiterate, I can't read, there's no excuse. That's God's standard. That's what you're going to be judged by. 
that everything that you see should have told you something created this. There's God. So let's say, you know, you still want to go ahead and say, well, it just didn't make sense to me. Okay, let's see, let's look a little bit about the Word of God. Let's look at the Word of God because you may argue that the Word of God, all these people could have just made things up. You're absolutely right. Matter of fact, not every faith could be correct. Christianity could be wrong, okay? But Christianity and every other faith can't all be right because they are all mutually exclusive. If Islam is right, Christianity is wrong. But here's the problem. If Christianity is right, everybody else is wrong. And that's what the world has a problem with. So let's go ahead and look at some of the evidence. Let's look at God's word, okay? God's word, God's word. It's written over 1,500 years. We're just gonna go ahead and really scratch this really quick. Um, I want us to go over to Hebrews 1. Let's look at verses 1 to 3 really quick. We've got to appreciate this. This says, Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. Let's stop there. So God spoke to the prophets. It wasn't like all of a sudden people became crazy. So what the prophets would have to do whenever they came themselves to be a prophet of God, and this goes into the Old Testament, okay? This goes into the Old Testament. I hope you appreciate this. They would have to say, God has told me, okay? Then there was a test that God gave. If someone says God told them, everything they said had to come into play exactly how they said. Or if not, you got to go out there and stone them to death. Well, that's just so... It's just so, so brutal. Well, God wants to make sure that we understand if someone says they're a prophet of God, everything they said has to happen. So the prophets would do miracles, i.e., you got Moses and Elijah. They did things that only they could do to this day. So then, obviously, what they were doing, they had to have some type of supernatural power. And then, like I said, the last thing, everything had to come into play exactly how they said. So although this gentleman was an absolute moron and said there's a bomb, you know, he was probably thinking that he was going to get away with it, but if the consequence would have been him taken out on the tarmac and stoned to death, he would have said, well, I, I just leave well enough alone. I guess I am not going to go ahead and do the bomb thing on the aircraft. No. Oh. So we got to understand that, but through prophets. So what's that have to do, Eric? Where are you going with this? Well, Daniel was so accurate that he even predicted, you can even say almost to the date, okay, when the Messiah was going to go into Jerusalem. And if you look at everything, pretty much to the date, you know, one or two days off if you want to be technical about it, okay. He didn't say on this date. He just said what year. But from the time that he made that prophecy when it was going to begin, 483 years, that's exactly when Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey. But you know what? It wasn't just Daniel that said something. Then you had another prophet that said something else. So when you look at all the claims that the prophets said, there were thousands of claims. Not two of them ever got together. They couldn't have conspired. So all these thousands of prophecies in the Old Testament prophets spoke about who the Messiah was going to be. Think about this, who the Messiah was gonna be. Jesus had to fill every one of them. So everything that they said spoke about the Messiah. And you gotta look at everything. Not one person came up and said, all oh, this is gonna happen. You gotta look at all their claims. Well, let's go ahead and continue. Now that we understand that, he says, in these final days, God has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to his son as an inheritance, and through the son he created the universe. Guess what? Christ created the universe. Yeah, he's not a created being, but we already knew that. And so the son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. Let's just stop there for a second. So now we have Old Testament prophets, and then it says that, through Christ, we have all the information that we have right now. How can this be? Well, before I actually answer that question, I want to go ahead and put something in the middle of this. We'll sandwich them together. But we have something called apostles. Okay, apostles. An apostle was somebody that actually saw Christ, and Christ spoke to them. And that's where we have New Testament. 
from. We don't have Christ writing his autobiography or sitting down and someone transcribing it. No. We just have our gospels where we have apostles that documented either what they saw or what was shared with them, okay? And that's where we get the New Testament from. So that brings me, we have prophets that did miracles that made very bold claims and they had to be answered very specific. They had to come about very specific, exactly to be specific, or they were to be stoned to death or it wasn't the word of God. Then all of a sudden we have apostles in between. Apostles did miracles that we will never see. And I know that's where a lot of people today, oh, it's just that you don't have enough faith, Eric. Oh yeah, I do have faith. I'm gonna talk about faith shortly because that's gonna be my next point. The apostles were actually those that received information from Christ. Remember, God the Father, and sometimes through Christ in the Old Testament, spoke to the prophets. Now he's speaking to the apostles, and now we have the New Testament through the apostles. That's why they did certain miracles that we will no longer see. And I know right now there are just so many people that hand you their business card, hey, you know, here's all my degrees, apostle or, or a prophet. You know, dude, knock it off, all right? Knock it off. You know, if you're an apostle, you know what? Show me where they physically laid you to rest and you came back to life because, you know, that's for them to authenticate that what they received was from Christ. That's what we see things. Does God do miracles today? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you better believe he does. There's no doubt in my mind. But the things that the apostles and the prophets did were to authenticate that they were actually who they claimed to be. And Christ shared to the apostles. The apostles document we have the New Testament. But here's where it goes, where I was getting at. Matthew 5, 17. What does Christ have to do in all of this? Let's go to Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Matthew 5. Look at what Jesus says his purpose is. He says, this is Jesus. Don't misunderstand why I've come, okay? I didn't come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. A little translation, I came to fulfill them. What does that mean? That means Jesus is saying, hey, I didn't come to change anything. But you know, all those thousands of prophecies, they spoke about me. Every one of them, I'm going to fulfill. You know, all you read about the Messiah, not most of them, not 98% of them, 100%. That's what I've come here for, everything. Well, goes on to verse 18. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. In other words, everything in this book, well, from the very beginning, going back to Deuteronomy, it gives us a test. And the test is, if it's from God, it's going to happen exactly. Okay, not partially, not mostly, exactly. Well, Jesus Christ fulfilled all those thousands of prophecies, and no, they could not have been self-fulfilling. One of those, he had to come from a virgin, the lineage of David. Okay, everything how he would teach. Whenever Jesus healed, that was one of the signs as to miracles that the Messiah would do. That's why when you read the book of John, John pretty much, his argument in John is, I'm just gonna show you some of the things that Jesus did, but some of those things that he did covered everything that he was supposed to do, how he would teach. Jesus didn't arbitrarily just go ahead and, oh, I'm gonna go to school of parables and take a philosophy in some Hebrew school. He did something that was never done before. He came and he started speaking in parables. Why? Because for hundreds of years before, said the Messiah would come and he would speak in parables. He would heal blind. He's gonna bring people back from their dead. He's gonna die and he's gonna resurrect again. Well, guess what? If Christ fulfilled all that and he gives us one big, bold statement in John 17, verse 17, and that is what? That is that God's word is truth. And if God's word is truth, Jesus fulfilled everything that was said about him. Jesus came and died exactly how they said. He was betrayed exactly how they said. And he rose again after the third day. But Eric, anybody can make that up. Okay, go with me to 1 Corinthians 15, because I want to show you one last bit of evidence. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15. Here's the deal, guys. You ready for this? Nothing that Christ did was not predicted by the prophets. 
okay? Nothing that we have in the New Testament contradicts the old. That's why people say, oh, the Bible is just filled with, con- filled with contradictions. Okay, show them to me. Look at what Paul is saying. Verse 3 says, I passed on, this is the Apostle Paul. I passed on to you what was most important and what had been pa- passed on to me. How was it passed on to him? Christ, he's an apostle. You've got to remember who Paul is. I'm going to share this momentarily. He says, Christ was buried and he was raised from the dead. And on the third day, it says, just as the scripture said. In other words, it would have been one thing if Christ would have been born. I mean, okay, something happened. Uh, he was born and, and they crucified him and he died. And all of a sudden he rose again. We'd say, wow, that's fascinating. But that's still not good enough. God is very precise. For hundreds of years, it was said that the Messiah would die by crucifixion and rise the third day. So Paul's saying, hey, not only did he rise, it was exactly how it was foretold. So now that we got that, let's go ahead and in verse 4, he goes, he was buried and raised, and on the third day, just as the scripture said, and here's your evidence. Verse 5, he was seen by Peter, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at the same time. And some were still alive when he was saying this. Verse 7. Then he was seen by James, later by apostles. Last of all, though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. Who was Paul? Paul was a diehard Jew. He hated Christians. He was persecuting them. He was there when Stephen was stoned to death. And one day when he was on his way to have Christians arrested so they could be executed, Christ appeared. Resurrected form. Here's a person that hated them, all of a sudden becomes them. Something had to happen. And he wrote half of the New Testament. So that's why the Apostle Paul is an apostle. He saw Christ in his resurrected form, and that's truly what, uh, you know, generally what we would call an apostle. Received the teachings from Christ. Um, Though we don't need to be dogmatic. Someone wants to call themselves an apostle or prophet. That's between them and God. Perfectly fine. Let's focus on the meat. The meat is what? God's word is truth. Everything that we have in there was foretold for thousands of years back. And now that we understand that and God's word has never been disproven, hey, if it's absolute truth, before we go on, God's word is absolute truth. Anything that contradicts that, sorry. Let's go ahead and go to verse 29 because I know time is taking. Let's go back. Luke 1, verse 29. Look at what Mary says over here. That was my spot here. Verse 29. The angel appears to her. She's confused and she's disturbed. I mean, I would too. I would probably jump out of the car and let it run. I, I'd panic. But I'm going to give her a lot of credit. But she began to think. Okay? She began to think. And she asked the angel in verse 34, how can this be? And then the angel goes ahead and explains it to her. See, Mary did not simply believe by blind faith, but we don't see that she was actually chastised or judged in any way. Why was Zechariah judged when he questioned? Second point that I want to make. Guys, faith... Faith requires that we believe God's word, but never through blind faith. If God's word is absolute, and we just looked at some of the evidence, you're going to believe it, all of a sudden this is going to begin to give you faith. But the Bible does not expect us to believe by blind faith. So what's the difference? The difference is that if we believe something by blind faith, that's not faith, that's lunacy. If all of a sudden you believe anything anybody tells you and they say you have to believe this because I told you to and it came from God and you take it for faith value, you know what, that's lunacy. You know what, I think you should be taken in and at least examined for at least 72 hours if not 72 years because you are gullible. Today you believe that, tomorrow you believe that. That's lunacy, the Bible doesn't expect that. So what's the difference? Here's the difference, God knows our hearts. The more we know of God's word, the higher his standard for judging us. Zechariah knew the scriptures. Obviously, this angel appeared to him. He knew it had to come from God. But he didn't question, okay? He defended. He defended his lack of faith. 
he defended his argument. Basically, this is impossible. It's not going to happen, dude, my paraphrase, because I'm too old and so is she. So, boom, foot in the mouth requires hand by an angel to the mouth. Shut up for the net and last night, for the next nine months, you're talking too much stupidity, dude. I'm going to go ahead and save you a favor. And I think that should happen to a lot of people that talk stupidity nowadays. I wish angel can come and angel Gabriel and shut them up for nine months or nine years or nine decades would probably do a solid favor. But the difference is, Mary's examining. Because if this would not have been foretold, she would have been in her right. John the Baptist was a prophecy. Okay? Spoke about Elijah would be coming. Zechariah should have connected the dots. Mary's thinking. She's asking questions. You know, when I first met Leslie, and we were just French at the time, I know ulterior motives, but you know, sometimes... <laughs> You got to do what you got to do. You know, you got to be a little stealth, kind of go underneath the radar. And she was very defensive. And, you know, she was, uh, um, you know, uh, first time that her and her friend and I kind of met. She started asking. You know, I, I made it very clear that I'm a believer. And she started asking me questions. And sure enough, and I started answering the questions. And she's like, well, that's interesting. And all of a sudden she said, you know, I've been part of the Church of Scientology. I've been with the Mormons, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, I was Catholic. And I've been to Christian churches, but I, I believe there's a God, but they're all so different. Great, we're on the right path. She's asking questions. And so over a matter of weeks, perhaps even a couple of months, that would be our dating. We'd go together, and she would be asking questions, and I'd be giving her answers. Until finally one day, it all clicked. She put everything together. It was the Holy Spirit. Well, that's what's happening to Mary. She's thinking, she's like, okay, angel, was this predicted? Because if it's not predicted, it's something that God was not going to arbitrarily just change his mind. He's not capricious or anything like that. He was not going to do. So she's thinking, okay, it's not blind faith. Had she just went ahead and taken it for granted, hey, great. I don't think she would have believed. Okay, we're going to look at some of these steps. So now that we compared Zechariah, he defended Sometimes you can be completely in the wrong, and you, no, 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 this is the way the word of God has to be. Hey, shut your mouth. You're wrong. Why don't you ask questions? Look at the evidence, examine it. That's what Mary is doing now. We've got to give Mary credit, because look at what happens. Um, verse uh, 37. For the word of God will never fail. That was the clincher. Once Mary kind of, they, they did say something about this. Yes, they did. You know, back in uh, Genesis 17, verse 17, God did promise something to Abraham. That's right, I get it. Okay, and when the angel says, God's will will never fail, he's using the word of God. She's right on. And what does she do? That's the game changer. Hey, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said to me come true. She didn't say, no way, dude. She said, let the Lord's will be done. And that didn't become as a result, a consequence of blind faith. Hebrews 11.6 says, With faith it is impossible to please God. With faith it is impossible to please God. Well, if we don't know the word of God, you're going to be placing your faith on anything anybody calls the word of God. You will be part of the church of Scientology. and Oh, and I'm going to go here and I'm going to go there and I'm going to go to church shop. You know what? For the rest of your life. You've got to go ahead and examine the evidence. Every other faith, I'm going to call it their religious disclaimer. They may pretty much, every faith has prophets. And they'll have a little disclaimer that their prophets have the right to change prophecies or even their own prophecies as they receive from God. The Bible makes it very clear that God will never change his word. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus just come, pretty much came, and he reminded me of that. He reminded all of us of that, but he reminded me personally that he came to fulfill everything, and Eric, and everything in this world is going to happen exactly how the Word of God says is still to happen. Look at Revelation and some of those other prophecies that haven't been fulfilled yet. But now that we know that, okay, God does not expect you to believe by blind faith. If you just arbitrarily believe something because somebody told you, then you know what? I question your faith. Because obviously you don't understand the word of God, so you don't know it's absolute truth, and you'll believe anything and everything thereafter. Let's go ahead and move up to the third thing that I want to point out over here. Because all of a sudden, I just read at verse 38, she says, I am 
the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. Think about it. If all of a sudden you just get this aha moment, the Holy Spirit touches you, and you see that you are serving the living God, that you just had an encounter with the living God, you cannot be the same. When Moses went up and he had that encounter with God, he came and he was glowing. I mean, he's like, dude, you're blinding me. You know, like when a cops pull you over and they put on all those lights and everything. Oh, this is brighter than that. And that was his face. You know, I had to pretty much, you know, don't stare at me. That's the way we ought to be. When we come to God's light, we're going to be transformed. We're going to have something happen that we are not going to be the same. That's what happens. She says, hi. I mean, she says, hey, I get this. But her faith has not fully matured yet as we are about to see. Again, prophecy had to be fulfilled. If it's God's word, what was the standard? Everything had to come about, okay? Third thing I want to point out, okay, that faith in God's word will lead you, will lead us towards serving God with a joyful heart. When our faith matures, and we're going to see Mary's faith is about to mature, because she was given some very uh, precise information, very specific. Elizabeth is about to have a child. Her and Elizabeth had not, they didn't, it's not like today, like, hey, what are you doing, girl? Hey, I'm over here. Hey, you know, an angel met up with me. Oh, wow, wow. You know, the funny emojis or crying emojis or whatever, or, you know, the, oh, I don't know. But I do know one thing. I mean, I, I know that they didn't do that, you know. Uh, I do know one thing. They weren't able to communicate. So Mary decides to pay Elizabeth a visit. She says, let God's will be done. But you know what? If it's God's will, and you're saying, let God's will be done, God's will is going to be done. If it was prophesied, it's going to happen. So let's fast forward over here to verse 39. It says, a few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, okay? And uh, remember, uh, there's about six months uh, into Elizabeth's pregnancy. Uh, Mary is pretty much just there. It says, a few days Later, uh, Mary hurried to the hill country day to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped. She's at least six months pregnant. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard you greeting the baby in my womb, jump for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. Basically, she goes in and all of a sudden, Elizabeth's like, oh my gosh, how, how was she filled with the Holy Spirit? How did she react? We don't have enough information. We just know that obviously, at that point, she was convinced. You know what? It just didn't stop there. Because see, the gospel of today is not the gospel of Christ nor the gospel, certainly, of the Old Testament, nor any gospel in the Bible. Because the gospel of today, like I said, the world, the, pro the, the, the promise of Christmas today is just certain to be a broken promise. It's not a promise of God, and it's a lie from its inception all the way through the end. The gospel of today is no different. The gospel of today promises to give you whatever you want because He's your God. He's got to bless you. Just ask and you're going to receive. Okay? So basically, we are not going to be satisfied with what Christ did on the cross. We come to church to demand more of God. We want to like bleed him out. Like that blood wasn't enough, dude. I, I, I just want more. That's what the gospel of today is. There's nothing in the Bible that says because you're a child of God, God is going to give you everything your heart's desired. Matter of fact, it says the opposite. We're going to see it right here. Because I said the following. We're going to learn from Mary. When that faith, she saw it. It made sense. This is real. I believed it. It's coming into fruition. I am here to do what? I'm going to move forward by faith. I'm going to serve the Lord. You know, today, you would think that right away, all of a sudden, we had charioteers show up with just a brand new chariot for Mary, and you know you got some gorgeous women with the little palm trees. Oh, and we're gonna hear to clean your feet. And all of a sudden a castle prompted just from the middle of the desert with a beautiful spring because, wow, because God's just blessing her. No, she had to humble herself to the lowest form. I mean, I think cockroaches at the time were considered higher than where Mary's about to go by her believing that and acting on it. You know why? Today, 
especially ladies, somebody called you a prostitute, it would be an insult. That's the new title that Mary would have to take on. Because it was a small town. I mean, if something happens here in church, a lot of people hear about it right away. Hey, you know, they still haven't consummated the marriage. She knows that the minute her pregnancy is made public, her reputation out the door. Well, I'm sure that she had an ambition and she viewed herself and Joseph just living happily ever after with, with you know, back then, now you wanna have two kids at the most, but maybe 20 kids back then and that's where they were gonna start. All of a sudden, that could have gone down the drain too because she knows that her husband is never gonna believe that. Not only that, what is she gonna do for a living because for the rest of her life, she would be looked at as being a harlot because that's exactly what she was gonna take on. Jesus puts it this way. Whoever exalts themselves will be humbled and not the way you wanna be humbled, trust me. But whoever humbles themselves before the Lord will be exalted by the Lord. And that's what the gospel teaches. So whenever you see and you examine the word of God, you're gonna see it is absolute truth. If it is absolute truth, all of a sudden your faith is gonna grow. But God doesn't expect you to have blind faith. As a matter of fact, blind faith is no faith at all. What do you believe if you haven't even examined the evidence? But when you do, it's not just gonna keep you there. Something internally is gonna begin to grow. You're gonna be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know what, you just can't stay and be the same person that you were. And you're gonna begin to serve God with a joyful heart. Guys, Mary humbled herself to the lowest. She didn't go in and say, hey, let it be as the Lord wants because I'm gonna be popular and rich, just the opposite. I'm sure reality just hit all of a sudden. I'm gonna ask you to turn with me to close it off to 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Second Corinthians 9, 7. Probably meditate on this. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Okay, let's just stop there for a second. God loves a person who gives cheerfully. I know what our hearts and our minds are actually there, all of a sudden saying, ah, he's talking about the finances. Yeah, part of it. But you know what God really wants from you? He wants your heart. God wants you. And he wants you to give yourself cheerfully to the Lord. And when you do that, you know what? Giving your finances, that's where you're gonna start and it will be joyful. Not only that, you're not gonna have enough time in your hands serving God because you're gonna have more and more, a stronger desire every time to serve him more. You're gonna be just like Mary, servant of the Lord. You are my life. You are everything. Something is gonna happen and you're gonna do so cheerfully. Again, the world and the, I'm gonna call it the pop gospel of Western, in the Western hemisphere today, i.e. America and every other developed country, is to get you to believe that God is your servant. That is a lie. The truth is that God gave everything for us. We have no excuse for knowing God. And if you have a genuine, wholeheartedly, wholehearted relationship with God, you're gonna wanna do nothing but put everything aside and place him first. And guys, gals, that is the truth about the real Christmas of the Bible. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in your name, Jesus, we come before you at this time. We just give you all the praise and worship you deserve. Lord, we just thank you for your word, and we pray that uh, we apply it in our everyday lives. Right now, Christmas has been pitched to us for everything that it shouldn't be. So many people are stressed out and they're gonna get themselves into debt, spend money they didn't have. There's gonna be so much hype. And in a matter of weeks, this will all be behind us. The world will not have rid itself of poverty. The world will not have rid itself of crime or violence, nor would there be more unity nor families that we're about to break apart gonna to come together for the rest of their lives. 
None of that's going to happen, Father. As a matter of fact, we're going to see crime increase like it never has. And it's a lie, Father. But Lord, when we come to you, there's nothing that we can buy because you paid the price and you're offering it to us. You want us to receive salvation that will give us hope. When we understand what that salvation really is all about through your word, we're going to see that it not only promises that you're going to be with us here on earth, but that whatever we do for you here on earth, we will take into heaven. And it assures us that we will be in heaven forever and ever, and there will be no more crying, there will be no more sorrow, but just joy. And Lord, if there's anybody here that does not have this gift or has not received this gift, I pray for them right now, and I pray that you touch their hearts. Perhaps there's families here that right now are being stressed out because they think in order to celebrate Christmas, they've got to go over there and do all these things that it was never intended to be. Christmas was about us receiving what you offered us and being grateful about it and sharing it with other people. The gift that gives on giving. You are that gift that gives on giving, Father. And that's what Christmas is about. But Lord, I just pray for these families that may be feeling the stress, that they understand that that's what the devil wants them to do. These families that will actually skip coming to church and congregating and worshiping you and skip giving their tithes and offerings to you, skip using the gifts that you've given them so they can go out there and hang out at the malls or at other places. Lord, that you let them know that's exactly what you don't want them to do. That's a rejection of you. Rejection of the true Christmas. Lord, that we understand that Accepting you does not mean we should expect more from you. That means we've received everything we need, and that's our salvation. And our standard should be to give you everything that we have, and that's not much because you don't need us, Father. You created the world and the galaxies that you're creating without us, and you will continue creating even after this galaxy ceases to exist. That we understand, Father, what we give to you, Father, we need to give you everything and Lord, if there's somebody here that may be serving you and, and they're just bitter about it, we pray that you touch their hearts right now and that they understand that they have a lot to be grateful for. That angels are joyful because they're serving you day in and day out. And it's not 24 hours because there's never any rest in heaven because they're always at rest because they're serving you. Lord, I pray that you guide us here as a church that we do your will in every way. And everybody that's serving and everybody that's working, Father, use them according to your will and that as a church, as a unit, as one body that we can actually not only celebrate Christmas in December but Christmas forever because this will be carried on into eternity as well in your name I pray